Today is December the 3rd, 2018. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University. Today I am in Anadarko, Oklahoma, to speak with Phil Perryman. And this is part of our Oklahoma Conservation Heritage Oral History Project, which is a collaboration between OSU and the Natural Resources Conservation Services and the newly formed Oklahoma Conservation Historical Society. I hope I got that right. And we're here to speak with uh, Bill Perryman, who started with the soil conservation in 1968 and retired in 2008. So we've got a few years to cover there. Let's first learn a little bit about you, when and where were you born? I was born in Altus, Oklahoma, May the 22nd, 1949. Okay, 1949. Tell us a little bit about your parents. Okay, my, my dad was uh, Fred Perryman. Dad uh, passed away in July of uh, two years ago, 2016, at the age of 89. My mother is still living. She lives in Tulsa in an assisted living, and we celebrated her 91st birthday last month. And did you have siblings? I have uh, three brothers and sisters brother and sister that are twins that are three years younger and then a brother that is 14 years younger than I am that lives in Dallas. So you're the oldest. They, I'm the oldest. I'm not the smartest and, <laughs> and not the wealthiest, but I'm the oldest. Well, what did your parents do for a living? My dad farmed for, oh, probably eight or nine years after he got in from the Navy. He'd enlisted in the Navy at 18. When he returned home, he farmed for eight or nine years and then decided that probably he needed to go to college. So he went to OSU, graduated in, in three years and two summers, and became a vocational agriculture instructor at Butler, Oklahoma. Okay. Then from there, he got on with the Soil Conservation Service in 1966, I believe it is. <clears throat> we moved to Walters. And all this time, my mother was a homemaker. She was had her beautician's license, and so she helped supplement the family with, uh, with the beautician's license. From Dad's start, with NRC or with soil conservation at that time. Yeah. We were at Walters one year, then he moved to Oak Mulgee, and then I graduated from high school and went to OSU in 1967. Then Dad went from Oak Mulgee to Okima, where he was a district conservationist there for a few years, and then moved to Clinton. Oklahoma as the district conservationist and retired from there in 19, probably about 71, okay. something like that. How had he initially got into it? Do you, do you know that story? Yes, I, I do. Uh, my Uncle Ward was one of the pioneer, I don't know if that's the proper word, but one of the initial conservation district people in in conservation district work in Oklahoma, one of the first seven or so that were in Oklahoma. So Ward Perryman was, was my uncle, and he influenced uh, my dad. And then my uh, his older brother, Tom Perryman, was also a district conservationist at Cheyenne and in numerous places. So dad had uh, a working knowledge of what soil conservation did and he enjoyed the outdoors and, and being active outside so I think that influenced him. Uh, hard, that's what, hard to switch from teaching into it? Yes it, it probably was uh, but it, it gave him more time. I remember just growing up dad was always too busy you know, people just worked him to death from daylight until midnight at night. He was never at home, you know, so if we wanted to go fishing or something, we had to work it in. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes he just told some people no, but 
the, the days were long for him and, and with soil conservation he got to regulate his own hours a little bit better. Okay. And did he have a he had a farm on the side? Yes, uh, he inherited part of the farm in Jackson County at, at Duke, which is right down the road from my uncle Ward. Uh, my uncle Ward's older brother was my granddad, hmm. and uh, at the age of fourteen, uh, my granddad had to take over raising the family because his dad had passed away, so he was a man. I guess the man of the house at age 14 mm -hmm. and, and raised and, and probably helped pay the way for my uncle Ward to go to OSU. He was the first one that, that had uh, a college education and I think if I'm not mistaken that was back, it was A&M back in those days. <laughs> How had they come to Oklahoma? Well. All, all that's hearsay because it was before me. Right. But my uh, granddad Perryman and, and Uncle Ward's parents had had come over right, probably from somewhere uh, across in Mexico or Texas or something at, uh, at the land run. Okay. They came in with uh, on a covered wagon and, and mules. We did find my Uncle Tom was interested in, in his, historical things, and so they found an old diary of my grandmother's. And uh, I remember reflecting on this once that I probably uh, was not tough enough to have been a pioneer <laughs> because yes. in this diary it told about she made a comment that one of her her daughters was ill with pneumonia and then a few days later there was a single entry in my baby died today you know you would have to be a pretty tough person especially if you were a woman mm -hmm. you know close to the family to to go uh, across the prairie and, and bury a child n never to see them again, you know, never see the, uh, the burial plot, if you will. Mm -hmm. So they came, came to Oklahoma, settled in Jackson County. I really don't remember what year that would have been, but in the 1880s perhaps. Before statehood. Uh, somewhere along in there. Uh, it may have been, you know, in the in the early '90s. I do. I don't. I don't recall all that. But there's still an old homestead down there on on Uncle Ward's farm, where they built uh, just a single room house, probably no larger than this this room that we're in now, and laid flat stones and then sealed it with mud, and. They built the corral out of the same flat stones that they raised their mules and confined their cattle and things like that. But that's uh, that's the way my family came to Oklahoma. Okay, farming, which a lot of people right. did in those Agriculture. days. Agriculture, but they didn't have a lot of the things that we consider necessities today. True. <laughs> my grandmother told me one time that. Uh, I don't know whether she was selling eggs or selling milk or whatever it was, but somebody needed uh, something and and they tore a, a dollar bill in half and gave her half of it. And next time they came, they gave her the, the other half so that she had the full dollar bill. But she was, uh, when she was 20, if I recall, she was helping my great granddad break horses and the horse threw her and broke her back. Mm. So she was bedding over in half the rest of her life until she was she passed to in, at ninety three. So she raised four boys plus the children she lost uh, over seventy three years just bent over in half. So tough mm. life. And tough woman. 
to be able to do that. Yeah. So, right, let's switch gears. Where did you go to elementary okay. school? We started in, in Duke. I started the first grade in Duke, Oklahoma, and went the first two weeks in the second grade. And then that's when Dad decided that uh, farming was not going to cut it to support his family. And we moved to Stillwater. Okay. And I went to second, third, and fourth grade in Stillwater. Then he got his first teaching job at Butler, Oklahoma. And we went from, I went from the fifth grade through my junior year in high school at, at Butler. And then at that point he got on with the Soil Conservation Service and we moved to Walters. So that was the, my, from my elementary through high school so your senior year was in a new school. Yes, it was, and that was a tough, you know, I thought that was the end of the world to leave Butler. And there, probably the population was about 300. So it was it was small town Oklahoma by all, all accounts. I think there were 15 in, in the class that I was in at Butler. And it gradually diminished to where I don't know what year they closed it, but the year before they had two graduating seniors. So mm -hmm. it continued to decline. And now they've consolidated with Arapaho and it's Arapaho Butler. So I mean, how many did Walters have? Probably oh, not. comparatively speaking, uh, there were 40 in my oh. class or something like that at then. Now I don't know what they've done I was only there one year. I still have friends and people that I see from Walters, but uh, they were twice as big. Maybe the town was more than that. Mm -hmm. They probably uh, around a thousand people in Walters when we were oh, there. It tripled then if it was mm -hmm. three. We thought that was big time. <laughs> <laughs> well, were you involved with sports or FFA yes, probably, or something? <laughs> probably more so than uh, than I should have been at some times, but I. When I moved from Butler, we played baseball and basketball, and Walters didn't have baseball, so I had to run track. Mm -hmm. Not very good, not very well, but I ran track. And then uh, my area of most enjoyable was basketball. Hmm. What, what position? Center? Center? Oh, what, what? no, I was... Uh, I was probably a, you know, they changed all that. It was, I was a forward. Okay. Now they call them by numbers, <laughs> but uh, a, a four guard or a four spot or something like that. But I was a forward. I was a little uh, skinny. <laughs> At that point, I think I was 6'2 and 160, something like that. But I did enjoy basketball, enjoyed those years, and I played town team ball until I was 42 years old, and I was on the church league at, at Woodward at the time, and, and was trying to compete with people 15 years my junior, and caught an elbow in the temple, knocked me out, and I remember waking up and thinking, you know, I believe I need to hang my shoes up and let the younger guys take over. <laughs> but I do enjoy basketball, or still enjoy watching it. My my son played at uh, Fort Cobb, and, and now my grandson is a freshman, and he's he's playing some basketball. So lots of lots of enjoyable times. I'm thinking who was who was the coach when you were at OSU during your time there. Well, Coach Iba <clears throat> coached the varsity, and I walked on. I tried to uh, walk on at OSU. Let me think. Doyle Perrick was from was the freshman coach. At that time, the varsity and the freshman had two separate teams. You couldn't play varsity as a freshman. Mm -hmm. So Doyle Perrick coached the freshman. And a 
occasionally Coach Iba would come out and watch us and and kind of see what whether we had any talent coming up. But that was uh, goodness a long time ago. I couldn't I didn't cut the mustard at OSU. My feet gave out on me. <laughs> Can I think of what year did you graduate from OSU? Graduated from OSU in 1971. Then I went, I took some time off from my student trainee position with NRCS. See, I was a student trainee in 1968, 1969, and 1970. Then graduated in 1971 and went directly into a graduate program at OSU to get my master's degree. And your plans were due to do what? Do you, did you know at that point? Well, at, at that point, I, I still intended on continuing with uh, with the Soil Conservation Service, and I did. But I took time off. They gave me a local appointment there in the Stillwater Field Office mm -hmm. to finish up my master's thesis. If I get to rambling, you get me back on, That's okay. on schedule. Oh. But they let me work there at the Stillwater Field Office, so I had to access to the library and could do my research. And so I didn't finish up my master's until 1975. But uh, a man that had tremendous influence on, on my life was Buck Clements. And uh, Buck came to me one day, uh, probably because I was a friend of his family and, and I was a friend with his uh, oldest son, Buddy. And he came to me and he said, I understand that you are getting your master's degree in, in, in horticulture. And I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, would you be interested if, if the Soil Conservation Service paid for your tuition and let you remain on on our uh, employ, would you go back and get add to that and get a degree in landscape design? I said, well, I hadn't thought of that, but you know, we'll sure visit about it. Come to find out they were needing someone that to work in watersheds that could influence which trees, for example, which trees to clear, which, uh, what to do to make it aesthetically pleasing. In the past, when, when a new watershed site was to go in along a creek or a watershed site, they brought the dozers in and they just cleared it of all of all trees, all all vegetation and slicked it off and consequently there was some silt that would go into that watershed site the first big rain they got. So they needed somebody to influence maybe to leave uh, leave certain hardwoods or something like that in the upstream from the dam. And so they sent me back to school for a couple of years and, and got my master's degree in landscape design. And let's see, I think I finished that in 1975. At OSU. At OSU. Yes, ma'am. Hmm. So a little longer than you had planned. A little huh? longer than I'd planned. A little longer than my dad had planned. He said, you know, he, I think he wondered if I was going to maybe be a professional student, as he put it. <laughs> Well, when had he graduated from OSU? My dad. Yeah, do you know what, what year it was? <sighs> Boy, let me think of that. 19... It wasn't but about 10 years. Seems like about 1957, something like that. While it was still A&M. Because I remember he was... He had taken some animal science classes, and I walked in to enroll in that same animal science class 10 years 
you see, after my dad had taken it. And the instructor said, my, my, it only seems like yesterday your dad was in my class. <laughs> so there was a sh pretty short gap. Uh, I started in 1967, and I think dad graduated from OSU in about, 57. That's that's close. That's close. And he was using the GI Bill to, to go? Probably did. Was he Probably in World War did. II? Did he have to serve yes, in World War II? Yes, he, he didn't ever see battle, I don't think, but he was in the Navy. I don't think he saw battle, but he was he was in the Navy. And his name, and his name was? Fred Perry. Fred, Fred. And what was your mom's name? Bonnie. Bonnie, okay. She was a foreman until they got married, and then she was a ferryman. <laughs> well, while you were in Stillwater as a youngster, which elementary school did you attend? Do you do you remember? Hillcrest, Hillcrest Elementary. We don't have that anymore. You don't. No. Do you know where McElroy cuts through? We lived in a little old apartment on seven hundred five McElroy. Do you know where? The Hillcrest Baptist Church is. Uh -huh. It was one, two, about three blocks north of that Baptist Church. Right. What is the the street that goes straight north? There's Jordo, Jordo or Stollard. What I'm. Uh, it's been too long. It's been too long. It was probably Highland Park, for Highland Park or Skyline. There, now, there was a, I, all I remember about the school was all covered with uh, our playground. Basically, was concrete. We had a big covered area that when we were outside. Now they did have some old basketball goals and things like that, but it was uh, goodness that was so long ago I, I don't know they may have demolished it and built a new but mm -hmm. it was just an elementary school as I recall okay I'll have to go back and learn some Stillwater see, history <laughs> see if it's still there or what's in its place well while you were in high school did you have a job part-time job or anything like that yes I did I worked at a furniture store after after class and sometimes if I'd get off early I'd go down and help them move couches and, and things like that, deliver them and and I I worked at United supermarkets there in in Walters some and did that after class and on Saturdays and and helped uh, what do they call the person that deli takes the groceries to the to the car. Bag, bag boys is what I used okay. to call them. I was I a bag know. boy then. Yeah. They may call them something that well. They don't do that anymore. And I and I drive a tractor for for people occasionally, haul a little hay, that kind of activities. I never was built for it. I was at that like I told you at that time. I was a string bean. I was too too long and drawn out to be a good hay hauler. <laughs> And you, OSU was going to be your college of choice regardless yes, yes because, it was. because of dad, primarily? I had, I had some basketball offers to smaller schools, but I just decided that I'd try to walk on, and if I made it okay, and if I didn't, that uh, my education was my goal. I knew that I could not go any further than college ball anyway, but it was it was good uh because I played on the fraternity that I was in, Alpha Gamma Rho. I played on their intramural basketball team, and so I got to stay with it for a while anyway. Well, that answers my question about where you lived, if you lived, yes. in, they lived in their, I lived in their in house. I the AGR house at, at OSU. And did you go to dances and that sort of thing? Did I go to what? To dances. Dances. I wasn't very good at that. Uh, I could move my feet on the basketball court, but I didn't do as well on the dance floor. But yes, we did. We had we had parties and things like that that uh, 
that was that was new to me at asking a, a young lady to attend something that a barn dance you know they may have come from the city a barn dance my goodness no I don't think I want to attend that <laughs> I'm trying to think that's about the time the Vietnam War was going on, too. It was. Do you remember it, it anything was. about I campus? I sure do. From that? We, if you were in, in school, you had a, an education deferment, I suppose, there for a while, and then they, then they drew lottery numbers along about 68, 69, somewhere in there. <clears throat> and I remember a friend of mine from Arapaho. We were all sitting in the TV room, waiting on. They they drew your birth date out of of a, a lottery, you know, spinning, and they they draw a certain number. And and this friend of mine, Lynn Shepard, was his name. The first number out of the box was his birthday. Mm. He didn't say a word. He just got up, left the room, and the next morning he went down and signed up for uh, the guard, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken. I was lucky enough that mine was 327 or something like that, so I was way down the list. I never, not that I'm not patriotic, I, I believe that those people that make the sacrifices for our country are the reason that that we are able to enjoy the privileges that we have. It's, it's definitely a sacrifice on on their part. Mm -hmm. I would have I would have served. I, it, it wasn't something that I would look forward to leaving my family, but I would have done it. Okay. Were there anything? Do you remember any protests that sort of thing on campus? You know, they probably were, but I, but I don't recall that. I don't recall people getting, uh, you know, especially not, they may have been vocal about it, but I don't recall any violence or anything like that. I didn't know. I haven't heard any, so I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> back in, back in, you know, we called uh, the hippie days, the, the hippie long days. hair, you know, some things like that, but uh, they probably did. And blue jeans were the typical attire. That's right. That's were they? To, to this to this day. See, here I'm. Well, I had read blue some, jeans now. Well, I had read somewhere that's when they came in right around the Vietnam era is when jeans started showing up. Is I don't that know right? if that's true or not. But well, it may have. May would have been, wouldn't I, make sense, I guess. You know, haven't hadn't thought of that. I I wore blue jeans in grade school, but they were because. My family didn't have a great deal of money. They were the cheapest blue jeans we could find. J.C. Penney, probably. And durable, too. Yes, I mean, yes. they, they lasted. Then you hand them down. My mother was a seamstress, too, and she could take them. I grew so fast that we had to uh, buy the longer lengths. And so she would put... Uh, a dart or whatever you'd call it. I'm not a seam, you know, I don't know about sewing, but she'd take them up in the length, and then as I grew, she'd take that out and make them longer, so we didn't have to buy two pair of jeans. <laughs> Some of the times, too. Yes, wasn't that's, like... that's right. My <laughs> mother was very good at being frugal. Well, that's that generation. Put too. A, when, when we'd eat, we'd just put another bone in the stew, so to speak. <laughs> what was the favorite thing she fixed for you? Oh, she could. She was a wonderful cook. She could cook about anything. Uh, most of the time, we were in a hurry, you know, to get back to basketball practice. So she might cook tuna fish, mm -hmm. make tuna fish sandwiches, you know, and have some vegetables or something with it. But she could. She could cook a roast on Sundays when we'd be go to church, well, she'd always have a pot roast on, and so when it got got home from church, it was ready for us to eat, see? That was kind of, that's probably one of her things that she enjoyed the most, was a pot roast and mashed potatoes, and or baked potatoes, or something like that. And that was before crock pots, that's or, right. or that's, microwaves. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right.
Okay, while you were at OSU, did you have a favorite professor? Oh, I had a lot of good ones. John Goodwin was, was very good. He was uh, my ag economics instructor. I had a lot of good, my degree was in agronomy for my bachelor's. I had a lot of, a lot of good instructors in the agronomy field. Probably if I tried to name a, a favorite, that would be tough. But I had a lot of good, good guidance in the agronomy field. That's, that's probably the field that I practiced the most after I became a district conservationist was my, was my agronomy degree. What would be some of the things you would use from it? Oh, soils probably was one of the big things okay. because of the, the basis of, of why soil erodes, for example. You know, lack of organic matter in, in the soil brings on the blowing wind erosion and that was one of the things that the Dust Bowl caused problems for Oklahoma back in the 30s and again in the 50s. But the lack of organic matter would be something that I could, that I learned in, about in college that, that carried forward into my career. And as well as alternatives to, to cropping. You know, sometimes back in those days we just farmed it and farmed it and put it in cotton until we wore it out. At that point, we, we came in with uh, grass programs that would plant the old worn out cropland back to permanent vegetation. And having an idea of what would be an alternative that a, that a rancher might use, whether it be native grass or Bermuda grass, love grass, old world blue stems, things like that. And, and that, that's something that I picked up in college too, was how to visit with a producer and, and give them guidance as to what might be an alternative, not only to preserve, keep the soil in place, but also that would generate them some income from, from livestock. It's, it's kind of one of those things that people have a little bit more confidence in somebody that, if you will pardon the cliche, that's been there and done that, mm -hmm. for for me to just say, well, I read a book one time or I read a magazine that said, if you would do this, then, and then you'd be all right and you could make a living off cows. But if I had tried it and it either worked or it didn't work, then I was, a little bit better prepared, prepared to to lend them some some guidance or or maybe speak from experience. I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking soil versus dirt. There is a difference, isn't there? There is. <laughs> soil is what you farm, and 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 dirt is what you get under your fingernails. <laughs> it's it's misplaced, so to speak. Oh, okay. <laughs> I had to correct my grand grandson occasionally, and they talk about dirt, and I have to tell them that it's soil when it's out there, in the, out in the pasture and in the field, it's soil. Well, when your dad was in the soil service, did he have the uh, the trucks that had the S S C S on the side? Yes, he did. They white were all, and green, or whatever. They were always an old Dodge pickup. It, their government was notorious for sending out bids, you know, they'd send one to Ford, to Chevrolet, and Dodge, and at that point, the old Dodge trucks were like a tin can. I mean, you could you could tell a block away when someone had a Dodge pickup, when they slammed the door, you could tell by the sound of it. There was no insulation in it whatsoever. They had no, they had a heater, and that was about the extent of it. There were no radios, no air conditioner, no extras on those old soil conservation pickups, and they were always a, a drab, kind of an army green at that point. We finally did make some progress by the time I retired, and at least they had some amenities and some extras on them. 
Well, when you started, what were they like? When you they were just was, about the was, same, was when, the same? When, I, when I started. They were usually a, an old Dodge, a green Dodge pickup back in 1968. Well, I mean, everybody in the neighborhood knew what that stood for, yes, I guess, that, too. that's right. They had they soil conservation on the door, and that is, that is true. They knew that was an old government truck, as they would call it. They, they might have known soil conservation. And, and to this day, a lot of a lot of people won't do not differentiate between the conservation district and soil conservation or NRCS. They'll say, "Well, out at, out at the government office mm. offices," or uh, they really don't know the difference about conservation districts in NRCS. Can you tell us a little bit what the difference is? Well, I'll try. I wouldn't be as good as a lot of other people, but conservation district was was where conservation work got started on local on a local basis, mm -hmm. and I believe that that's the place for it. Conservation districts is is a from the ground the local decision makers. There were five men elected and. Uh, nominated in some cases to be the local representatives hmm. and but they are local people usually in the county in which that office is located and they're uh, they're ad administered through the state of Oklahoma they're a state the employees of the conservation district were state employees as opposed to that the employees from soil conservation and NRCS are federal employees. So that's a little bit of the the difference between between the two. But it is it it's a ground a, a local starting point for policies that that I believe is is and is still needed is through conservation district work. So it's important for the SCS -S 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 and NRCS to be friendly and get along with. Yes, it is. It, support to, each to other. have a good to good have a good working relationship, and that didn't always happen. I mean, with with different personalities, mm -hmm. there there are clashes that go on, and as long as the people kept the the overall goals in mind. Here's where we're headed, and not to be. There were some uh, problems with conservation people, and there were some problems with NRCS employees losing sight of what the long-term goal might be. And mm -hmm. and sometimes, if they got a little bit selfish with with what they wanted to do, then there were some disagreements. But in in ninety nine percent of the cases, they were worked out and and things flowed smoothly. Well, typically that they would be from that area, but the conservation person, the federal person, could have come from that. That is correct. That, yeah, California correct. somewhere. Usually, let's just take Caddo County, <clears throat> for example. They would try to find five people that were interested in in conservation work from around the county might have someone from the north and the west and south and east so that they represented the the ideas of the people in their uh, in their area of the county but like me I had I had spent two separate terms in Boy City Oklahoma which is in the northwest of the Panhandle and some in Woodward and some in Claremore and four or five different locations over the years and here I was the new man in town. I, I was not familiar with with what the erosion or the conservation difficulties or problems might be mm -hmm. in Caddo County. They were. So for the first few years I had to learn from from those people and get their guidance. Well how did this county different from the ones you had been in? Probably as different as night and day. Mm. This this county is probably one of the most diverse in the state of Oklahoma. 
especially the ones that I had worked in. Now, granted, I had not worked in all the counties, but I worked some in all the areas. But, but from a field office standpoint, there's everything from hard clay to, to sand, deep sand in this area. The Sugar Creek watershed in Caddo County is one of the most erosive that there is in the state. It was very difficult to, to manage that sandy soils and we have in Long Sugar Creek, it's, that's the reason it was named that was because it it's just about like farming sugar. It's very granular and very erosive to, to wind and water. So it's probably the most difficult location I had ever worked in. Boy City, lots of irrigation, but most of it is as flat as this floor. It's, it's, uh, it's a different county too. The people were good, good to work with out there, but it was, it was a, a different than, than Caddo County. I don't know if they can, Claremore's more wooded, is it? Yes, Compared is. to yes. the Panhandle. Yes, we, we lived in Claremore prior to coming to Caddo County. And, but I was in the area office then instead of the field office. So I was a, a resource conservationist at, at Claremore and I would give guidance to, to the district conservationist about what they need to do to their conservation planning activities and, and I dealt with the resources through them. I was not directly involved with the producers. Mm. So that's, that was, that's a little different position. Well, before we get too confused, let's back up then and just go through okay. your career from your, that, your training and then each, that, mo each that's, move. That's good. That probably would, so I don't jump around so much. Well, I'm doing that, so. In 1968, I worked in the Boy City field office for Darwin Hedges, was the district conservationist, as I recall. And most of our work was with, with irrigation. People want that might want to row irrigate back in those days. This was back in the days that there was not as many irrigation circles as there are today. In 1969, I worked at the Sentinel field office through the summer. It was primarily dealing with conservation planning. I was I was in my second summer, so I stepped up and had a little bit more responsibility. Probably, and I'm not going to mention the name of the DC then there because some of the things that I I learned from him was things not to do. <laughs> he he enjoyed going to the coffee shop way more than than I did. And right then, that second summer is when I I made a a vow to myself that I was never going to abuse. the time that I was given and the liberties that I was given to to give voters the the sense that I was working for the government and that I was not going to earn my paycheck. Mm -hmm. You hear comments, you know, the district conservationists there might take way longer than a 15 minute coffee break at, at the cafe and they'd see him in there again at lunch, and so, well, here comes the government, you know. Are we, uh, it's our tax dollars at work, those kind of things. So I made a vow there at, at 19 or 20 years old that I was not going to do that. And I hope that I fulfill that, that promise to myself. In 1970, I worked the Norman Field Office as a student tra trainee, and that summer is my third one. I was given more responsibilities, and and let's see, Jess Morrell was my district conservationist. He would send us out uh, 
on our own occasionally mm -hmm. so that we just like you would raise your children you know as they get older they're more responsible that's the way he did me and let a gave, gave my made my leash a little longer I suppose then after 1970 when I graduated in 71 I went directly that summer into my master's program at OSU then until about 1975 after I had finished then I worked in a Stillwater field office for Don Jackson then after I finished my master's thesis I went directly to the state office which which is a little unusual uh, at that time, but that's when I moved into that landscape design position. Fred Fortney was my supervisor. Who he's another man that had tremendous influence on on my life and my career. Mm -hmm. I still uh, like to visit with Fred and tap his brain about about how things are going. I saw him at the retirees meeting the other day, and he doesn't look a day older than he did than I thought he was 25 years ago or 30. <laughs> then, about 1978, our state office started getting some pressure from the national office to the degree, and I they didn't. They didn't clue me in as to why, but at the national office in Washington, D.C., the person that was a landscape, was a landscape engineer, not a landscape design specialist. Mm -hmm. And I did not have the degree to, to coincide with that. So our state conservationist said, Phil, we're gonna have to go back to the field with you and they're going to move a, an engineer in here and design to do the work that we've been doing. So I accepted a position. I applied for a couple of district conservationist jobs. One of them was at Altus, came open, and I said, well, I would consider Altus. And they said, no, we can't. We can't place you in Altus because your Uncle War is on is chairman of the conservation district. That would look like conflict of interest. So you can't go to Altus. Sayer was open and my dad was at, at Clinton at the time. That's the county that just adjacent to Custer. The area conservationist Olin Rowlett said Oh, Phil, your dad's the D.C. and Clinton. I think putting you that close to to your dad would be a mistake. So you can't go to can't go to Clinton. I said, well, you're wanting me to go back to the field, but you're closing all the the opportunities. I finally made application as the area resource conservationist in Woodward, and Jack Jones who you may have interviewed was our uh, eventually would be our state conservationist in, in Oklahoma. Jack Jones was the area conservationist in Woodward and he took a chance on me at Woodward and I worked there as area resource conservationist. In 1980 see 78 somewhere along in there I've forgotten the dates I resigned from NRCS and joined my father-in-law and brother-in-law on the farm in Harper County and enjoyed it learned learned some additional things that that my I might could apply at a later date but we went through some, some very tough times in agriculture. The oil bust came along. We'd had the boom and everything was roses. 
the oil bust came along and farm farm commodity prices dropped and so what turned into a three family farm turned uh, came into a two family farm and not making enough to support three families on the farm so I made the decision to to come back to work for NRCS if I could find an opening George Moreland had an opening at Boy City and so I accepted it went back to Boy City as as a second appointment as as a soil conservationist worked there a year then then George had an, an opening in in Woodward on the area staff I believe it was 19 86, about then, they came in with the Food and Security Act, which said that highly rotable lands must have a conservation plan in order to continue to, to get USDA benefits. Highly rotable lands and swamp buster, those kinds of things came in. George needing some, needed someone to administer that program in the area office at Woodward. So I accepted that position. It was temporarily funded. <clears throat> I held that job 86, 87. Mm, those years kind of all grow together. <laughs> I believe through 1990. the funding dried up. They came to me and, and said, we're going to have to find a job in somewhere else for you. This one's no longer funded. They had offered it to, to someone. Let's see, I believe it was the Claremore job at that time. George came in and they, they turned it down. I came in from Cheyenne one afternoon, came in the office and George was, everybody else had gone home. He said, Phil, come in, I've got something to talk to you about. He said, the state office called today and, and offered you the, the job at Claremore. I said, oh, clear across the state. I said, well, what? What happens if I say no? He said, you've got the same option that Angie did. They made Angie retire or resign if she turned it down. I said, okay, how long do I have to make up my mind? He said, they said, as long as we know by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, <laughs> that'll be plenty soon enough. So I had overnight to make up my mind. But we took it and learned from it. It probably would not have been on our agenda to move, but you know, sometimes you accept accept those things and go on. And I learned, I worked with good people and and enjoyed uh, the time that I was, we lived in Ulaga and worked in, in Claremore from 1990 until 91. Not long. No, not really. A, a little over a year, probably a few months over a year. And then I made, because my objective was to get back to the field where I had daily contact with farmers and ranchers. Mm -hmm. In those area office jobs, you, you see your fellow co-workers and your peers, but you really don't see the results on the land mm -hmm. as much, and you can't It's, it's an emotional attachment that you have with the people that you work with on, on the land to see the, the good things that happen to them and, and share in that, those good times. Mm -hmm. But when the tough times hit, you're there too. So in 1991, I accepted the district conservationist job from Nick Lambeth 
had known Nick most of my life. He was my dad's area conservationist there in Clinton. And he probably reluctantly <laughs> hired me for the job here in Anadarko in 1991. And I was here from 91 until 2008. And you were allowed to stay in that position for that length to, of time? Yes, yes. I didn't, uh, I didn't make any further requests. But they could have appointed you. Well, they could have. By that they time, they may not have changed their they, mind. They could have. We, I, we always talk about that. <clears throat> I guess being a small town person and people, a person that enjoys the rural community, we've always had a little bit of a, a friction. When Washington, D.C. wants somebody has a, has a vacancy, they send out vacancy announcements. Well, people that are, are tied to the land like I was, I didn't apply. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have wanted to have moved to Washington, D.C. to work in that that environment and that traffic and that congestion. So, and there were other people like me that didn't. They passed up on it. The opportunity for, for advancement, you know, you get a uh, higher GS grade, higher pay, mm. but the cost of living is, is more expensive. Mm -hmm. So we, pass, we passed on those jobs. Well, by doing that, then the opportunity passes to someone else down maybe a little lower that might have been stagnated in their job and they knew that they were never going any higher unless they moved on to Washington, D.C. Well, then we get people in Washington making policy for the state of Oklahoma that may not have the experience to really justify it. Now, I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes when I say this, that will view this. But in some cases, that happened. Then when we had to, we had to live by those policies as they were, as they were brought down from the national office. But we had, we had lots, of, lots of good times in, in Anadarko and, and, and in Caddo County. I don't regret making that move. It, uh, there were sure some tough times. Probably one of the things that influenced my retirement was uh, I saw the anguish. We had a flood in October of 2007, had 15 inches of rainfall just in a Saturday and Sunday. No place for it to go. So down through Sugar Creek in that highly eroded area, it, it, it broke uh, two or three, went through the spillway in two or three of our watershed sites and took out roads that, that you just can't imagine, uh, 30 or 40 feet deep. Wow. It did destruction that, that was unparalleled in, in this county. And I saw the anguish, people that had been in agriculture their whole lives come into my office with tears in their eyes. What am I going to do, Phil? How can I, how can I make a, a living on this farm now when it's cut, it's cut to pieces? And it was difficult. It really was. Probably one of the most emotional trials that that I had gone through probably. Mm. You know, when you see people that you look up to and you respect and you know that their lives have been changed forever, that are are good farmers and good agricultural people. It wasn't that they had made poor decisions that affected them. It, it was just an act of nature that, that came along and, but it did affect their lives and, and to some extent it still is 25 years later. Would, would have more watersheds helped prevent that? You know, that's a good question. I don't know, you know, with, with funding the way it was, 
that's probably the bottom line is why, why it slowed down was because of funding. Mm -hmm. they, they tried on priority basis to know where, where to put it, but where to put those watershed sites. And I think for the most part they did, but with that kind of a rainfall, that, that might have been in the, I know it was a hundred year rain, it might have been more than that mm. with, with, the, with how rapidly the, the rains came. There was just, the soil couldn't take it that fast and it was running off and with the soil types that we have in that Sugar Creek area, it, it just blew holes that, that you could uh, put a house in just overnight so I don't know that that's a good question Tanya I don't know if if more would have been better it wouldn't have hurt what did they blame blame them not lasting for the floods I mean for the damage being more than well probably over over the years see what happens, they've, they've changed the way they've built them. They've put some more fl flood storage in them. Mm -hmm. They've put more freeboard. They were not built to, to, I think the life of the average watershed site would be 40, uh, 40 years, something in that, in that range. Maybe, maybe a good one would go 50. But over the years, in that, especially in the Sugar Creek Basin, <clears throat> they got silted up. And so being shallower, they didn't have the amount of storage capacity that they did that they had when they were first built. And so they need to be rehabilitated. And now they have gotten some funding, I believe, in the last 10 years or so to rehabilitate a few. I know Danielle Metz is the district conservationist here now, and she's overseen the rehabilitation of a few but it's so much more expensive, as you can imagine, mm. to redo one now than it was to build it initially. And so funding dollars has always been an issue with, with NRCS and soil conservation. As to, you asked the question, would more have been, you know, they, they worked on them until money ran out, mm. probably. Yeah. I just wondered if they blamed coming in angry because you know blaming you for oh uh, for the there might have been a few people that that did you had to you had to take that with the good with the bad I'm sure you know because certainly I I didn't do everything right so there's always blame to go around but it. It doesn't good, do any good to point fingers, really, especially in hindsight. Right. We all we all did the best we could with what we had. Well, in nature, you can't weather. You can't. No, no, that's true. Can't change really. We see we see now, you know, the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the devastation that occurs with tsunamis and earthquakes and you know those and and wildfires in California. You know, we're blaming the the management of the forest on the on the wildfires. That you know, to to lay blame and say this was your fault or you should have done this, that 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 doesn't help us. I don't think. Nope. Well, if that was the one of the harder moments, where there's some. Happy, happier times. Oh, sure, it's a very sure there were. One. To to see the 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 times that well, as a small example, we'll we'll do this. When the equip program came in, I can't quote the year, but let's see. I believe we moved from Soil Conservation Service to NRCS in about ninety four. Nineteen ninety four. That's correct. Okay. We, we made some changes in the EQIP program to, to provide incentives to, to people that would no-till. Mm -hmm. 
96. 96, okay. Getting within two years is pretty you're, good for no, me. No, you're doing great. <laughs> yeah. But we provided incentives for people that would move from conventional tillage to no-till. And if you can imagine in our in the area up around Eakley and in north and west of here, the people that had conventional tillage in the bad months of the year, the the spring and again in the fall, the soil would begin to move and, and it would block the highways. It would get so bad, just drift like snow. And it would block the highways. And there had been some people that it really had devastated. And so they were prime candidates for for going to no-till, which is, involves a, a combination of spraying for weed control instead of tillage, and then use a, a different kind of a drill, a no-till drill, to plant their, their small grains or their cotton or their grain sort of in right in that, that mulch. And I have had numerous people say that was that was a saving grace for me to to not have that my topsoil blowing away in in the fall of the year mm -hmm. so those are, are uh, that's just one example of someone coming back to you and and being able to say thank you I appreciate it with that's on the back <laughs> <laughs> Those little moments keep yes, you going, don't yes, they? Yes, that, that's right. That's just you know when you uh, when your son or your daughter come to you. They I've always heard that the teenage years, you know, when you get to be a parent and your kids turn teenagers, then your IQ drops twenty points, and you don't regain that until they are about twenty early twenties or maybe twenty five, and they may get kids of their own and they. All of a sudden, you gain those 20 points back in, in IQ and are a lot smarter than they ever thought you were. <laughs> so some of the things we look back on, you know, we make lots of mistakes in life. We hope that we can, we can compensate and make a few good ones to overcome those bad ones. Well, how big of a county is Caddo? You know, I used to know it's about an hour's drive, about 60 miles from north to south, and about 30 from east to west. Is it primarily uh, cotton, or, or is it...? No, it, we, we grow everything from, everything from vegetables. We've got, we've got people that specialize in peppers at, at Hinton, but the soils here can grow just about anything that you want to try. Hmm. We've got we've got corn, we've got grain sorghum. We we do have cotton this year. There's more cotton, Wh lots of wheat, but but a lot of people have have tried with things everything from melons. We grow a lot of watermelons and cantaloupe and things like that. But it will just about grow anything that that you want to try. The Our growing season is is about about right for a lot of crops. Mm. You know, up north, they they were limited until the last few years on growing season for cotton. So we have the soils and, and the irrigation water in some cases to grow a lot of, lot, a lot of diverse cropping. Well, is the Sugar Creek watershed the only one that, that's in the county? Oh, no, no, we have and I can't, I don't remember how many watersheds. If I had a watershed map, that would, that would tell you, but it, the Sugar Creek is probably the largest one. Mm -hmm. It runs from s south of Hinton, up around Lokiba, until it gets into the Washita River right out west of town. So it's a long one, and it involves quite a bit of acreage, but there are there are other watersheds besides Sugar Creek. Well, were you in the county when they were getting easements to do the watershed and all of, all of that part no, of it? No, I wasn't. Uh, that was before my time. Was it before? We had, we had, I don't remember.
remember exactly when they started that, but we had easement specialists that would specialize in that and go when they decided that they were going to have a watershed program and build the structures in an area, they had people assigned to go to the producers and, and say, here's what we can do for you if you will give an easement to let us put this watershed here. Here's what we can do. That's how we can help you. Would that be your office or would it be the conservation district? It, the they, district had, they had special offices for those people Just that worked. That. And they had, they had uh, watershed offices that would actually go out and do the staking and things like that. So it was the different. In those days, there were a different office than the field office. Uh, I don't recall, you may have that timeline. At one, at one time, we were a work unit, they called it. And in about 19, seems like maybe the late 60s, they moved that from, and I may be all all wrong there about that, they moved from a work unit conservationist to a district conservationist. But they made that, that move just like we moved from soil conservation to NRCS. Mm -hmm. They made, they made uh, over the years, they changed us, changed our title a little bit. So you're, when you started all of this, did you, was being the DC your end goal? Probably was, without without really a conscious thought about it, because I worked in each case <clears throat> with the people that were district conservationists, mm -hmm. and I saw what they did and their interaction with the local producers, and I liked that. I liked to be able to to work with those individuals and for them to, to work together for us to make improvement. And that was harder for me to see as an area employee, mm. as a resource conservationist or a Food and Security Act specialist or something along those lines, or a landscape design specialist for that matter. We didn't get to see the, the progress as easily as a person did in the field office. Which one of those would pay more? Would have more responsibility? Well, see, in Oklahoma, maybe the same in other states, we have different GS grades, different hmm. levels of pay in different field offices, primarily because of the, the difficulty of the responsibilities we have in Oklahoma originally there were some GS9 field offices we had one in Hinton and one in Fort Cobb in this county for example they've done away with all of those now everything is either a GS11 or a GS12 the original thought was is that we're going to make the metropolitan areas they made Tulsa Oklahoma City Norman, Lawton, and there probably were some more. They made those GS-12 offices. Everybody else was 11, mm -hmm. primarily because of population, meaning the number of people that you had for clients. That changed, I don't recall what year, but it did change when we went through, instead of population, it went through diversity of programs, the number of contracts that you had when we went through the Great Plains program, Caddo and Custer, for example, were, were two of the, the leaders in the number of GP contracts. So those, those counties with the diversity of the programs and the difficulty were given a different rating, I, supp I suppose, than than say someone that only had one program to administer. So there were certain offices that were made into GS-12s. Clinton Field Office, Caddo Field Office, Altus was eventually made a, a 12. And since then they've expanded it and there are a, a lot more. Hmm. 
but probably, see, I was a GS-12 at, at Claremore in the area office, and I was a GS-12 here, so it would just have been a lateral move for me. The, the level of uh, responsibility and what gave me more gray hair <laughs> was probably here in Caddo County. <laughs> At the end of the day or a weekend when you'd get sit around the table with your dad, would you all discuss, you know, compare notes or whatever? We would. Uh, it's, it's amazing, though, that after he retired, and now I, I see this because I retired, it is so rapidly changing. Technology changes and all of the, those things. But even he would come and ask questions on, on his farm when he retired there at Duke, he'd say, what do you think? You know, you see this every day. I've lost track of it. What, what do you think? You know, if you run into anything that might help me. So those were, those were good times. And I mentioned to you earlier, I might bring this up. Uh, that's probably, I retired at 50, age 59. And I'm so thankful that I did, really, because I got, I got to spend 10 years with my dad, uh, working with him and, and bonding, if you will, a uh, time that I would not have had if I, if I were still working today, for example, because he, he passed away at, at age 89. But those, that, that's good. I hope, and I think it was, I, I, I hope that it was as good for him as it was for me. Well, he got to see you do what he did. I mean, that's, right. that's pretty cool, too, from his standpoint. I think so. Sure do. Yeah. Well, and then other changes during that time, the computers came on board. That, that's right. And, and, and like I said a while ago, Probably that Sugar Creek episode and that and that flooding and the and how difficult it was for me uh, when computers came on was probably one of the reasons that that Dad retired. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "I can't operate those things. I, I just I better just let turn this over to a younger man." <laughs> he was not. Uh, a technological, technology. got my tongue twisted. He was not technology inclined, I'll put it that way. Well, during that time period when you stepped out of it and were farming with your father-in-law? Yes. Your father was still working at that point? Yes. Did yes, he offer he you advice as to <laughs> whether to do this or not do this? No, not really. He, he he realized that that's what I wanted to do, and so he he went along. My phone's buzzing here. I'll probably <laughs> have to look at it after a while. He, he probably had his opinions, but he was very good at not at letting me make my own. You know, I, I remember that when he probably preferred that I not play basketball at OSU. But we sat down and talked about it, and he said, I feel like, I really think that you probably just need to emphasize your academics. And I said, but Dad, if, if I don't try, 10 years from now, I may say, you know, maybe I could have made the team. And I tried on my own, and it didn't work. And so then I'm convinced. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what he, he let me make the decision on my own. And it didn't work. I came back and, and uh, I think he respected that. Sure do. Well, I, I hope so. I respected him for not uh, uh, being more vocal and trying to influence me. Well, was that the time that you were getting into the Simmental Bulls? Oh, did I oh. Say, did I say that correctly? Simmental? Yes, you did. I had, my wife and I had just gotten married. I believe so this that's was... that's further back, okay. Uh, 
I was uh, living in Perkins, and that was when I was working for Fred Fortney in, at the state office as a landscape design specialist. Okay. <clears throat> and I had uh, an old school lease down by Kearney and had bought 10 old cows, but it didn't have a bull. So to make an operation, you've got to have a bull as well as cows. I saw an ad in the Stillwater newspaper and Bob Tadasek had an ad that he had a, a young Simmental bull. So I called Dr. Tadasek and went up and looked at the calf. He was still on the cow, just almost a year old. I don't remember now how he had, it seems like he had him priced at $500 and I didn't have $500. That sounds so cheap this today, see, but it, it, back then it was different. Well, in about a week, I, well, I had told Doc that I said, let me think about it and I'll see what I can do. He called me back and he said, Phil, this cow is, is going to calve again. I need to get this calf off of the cow. If you'll, if you'll buy him, I'll let you have him for $350. So I said, I'll take him. And that was my start in getting in Simmental, and I, I bred those old Hereford cows to the Simmental bull and, and got along wonderfully. The calves sold better and everything. So that's what started me, and I still raise Simmental cattle to this day. All along, I mean, mm -hmm. it's all along. In and out, but I, I've had some Simmental cows for, goodness, that was 1975, so what's that been, 40, almost 45 years, almost, isn't it? Yeah. Have you kept track, do you have any of the generations from that first, from that first? You know, I involved? haven't thought about that, uh, Tanya. I, I probably have some some genetics that may be similar. They go back there. I, I'd have to track that down. Maybe. I know I know I'd be surprised from the time in the last 25 years, for example, since I've lived here. We do have some. My daughter and I uh, still have some cow families that that still move through our herd, and we we keep the females. So they last a long time, even though the old grandmother might not be in the herd, you know, her daughters and the granddaughters still are. You keep records that you could, mm -hmm. could go back and mm -hmm. look to see? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, while we're talking about daughters, how did you meet your wife? Do you want to speak to that a little bit? My, my wife was one of, uh, her brother is a fraternity brother. And so when we have family get-togethers and picnics and things like that, well, uh, she came with, with her family down when she was still in high school. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then she, because her brother was, was an AGR, uh, she was eligible for what they call roommates. And she was in a sister sorority and came over to the house for meetings and and things like that. And, and so finally I got up the nerve to ask her to marry me after I, we were in graduate, I was in graduate school. But that's how I met her. So she's an OSU alum as well? Yes, that's correct. What was her major? Uh, early childhood education. Okay. She enjoys preschool and, and taking children from a young age and moving them through and, and seeing the progress that they make. and. A people person too. She's, yes, she enjoys and she works here in the church. She, we have a, a program for children here that's called uh, that that she works with. And what's her name? Lana. Lana. Might Lana. as well get that in there. And we have two children. Our daughter uh, is adopted, Lindsay, and we have a son that. There's 14 months difference in them. Lindsay helps me 
with our cattle operation and she and her husband have a ranch over south of Carnegie and Mountain View. Mm -hmm. So she helps her husband some and helps me some. And my son works for P and K John Deere out of Norman. He's a salesman for P and K. So both agri agriculture related. Yes, that's right. It's it's uh, let's see, hard to get the country out of the kids is or their dad either one. I'm just thinking to get some back in the in the NRCS so you'd have another <laughs> the third a third generation. Well, they may have they may have seen me. Uh, pacing the floor at night and decided they didn't want to do that. I don't know. Well, they understood what you were doing. Yes, they did. Yeah. And results and stuff. I had to I had to help them write speeches occasionally and occasionally it'd be on conservation, so they knew those things. They were both active in 4-H and FFA and things like that. Mm -hmm. My son made uh, a state farmer and American farmer. Mm -hmm. And when they would have Which graduated from Anadarko, or were they? No, they them? both graduated from Fort Cobb. Fort Cobb, okay, before you got here. My Alana's, Alana's mother, was a Fort. Graduated from Fort Cobb, so we had history of, of being in Caddo County way way back. Through the Milwee family, and so because their grandmother had gone to school at Fort Cobb, they elected to go there also. Where we live is right in the kind of the triangle between Apache and Fort Cobb and, and Anadarko, so we could select any of the three schools. They selected Fort Cobb. Okay. My son was on the 2000, that seems so long ago, does but Fort Cobb won, won the state title in basketball in 2000 when Brock was playing and then since then we've won four or five more. Yeah. We, the fact is in 2000 we've won four in a row. Won eight, 18, 17, 16 and 15 as I recall. Four years in a row which is yeah. Sm rare, I'll put it that way. It's not unprecedented. There are other big schools that have done that, but for for class A and B schools, that's that's rare. So what are you doing these days now that you're retired? Well, I'm retired from NRCS, but I, I still run a herd of cattle, mm -hmm. primarily Angus and, and Simmental cross cows. My daughter and I run, oh, 90 to 100 head of cows and we're starting to to cut down a little bit. I promised my dad on his deathbed that I would not drag this out until somebody else had to do it for me. So I'm, I gradually sell a few until I'm going to get down to about 40 or 50 head over the next year or two mm -hmm. so that I can handle it a little easier. Well, do I you remember? Move, I don't move quite as fast as I used to. We don't. None of us do. Do you remember your last day or week on the job? Oh, I remember my my last day. They had a retirement party, and I I cried like a little boy. <laughs> you didn't want to leave. Oh, I think probably looking back is that I didn't. What I didn't want to leave is the camaraderie of the yeah. the my fellow employees. I didn't miss the emails every day from my boss requesting a, a report. <laughs> but uh, I, I worked with good people. The, it's never the supervisor that does the work. It's always the, uh, the people you have working for you that do the work, it really is. I was thinking in the time that you were in the, in the uh, program. More women came on board. Yes, they did. There was did. a time when you first yes. started. There probably weren't very that, many. That's right. It was it was a rarity uh, back in 1968 to have anybody that a woman that even wanted to. Not that not that maybe they there was not an opportunity if they did, but uh, they just didn't want want to do what we did. And I don't really recall 
what year more women started, but but I had uh, several ladies that worked for me here mm. in in the Anadarko field office, both as technicians and as as conservationists that have gone on and done quite well. They've done very well at it. And you mentioned the current DC is a female. That's correct. How was she received in the in the community? Well, I think well. I'm uh, assuming she is the first first female in, in that role. That that I'm aware, Danielle is the first for Caddo, female for Caddo County conserva district conservationist in Caddo County. Sure was. Now we had uh, soil conservationists as trainees, basically. But uh, I think she was the first supervisor. You think she went over smoothly, or did it have? I some... think so. Uh, there's always, as as a change, you know, she probably got this old song and dance just like I did about when I came. Well, that's not exactly the way Gary did things, <laughs> you know, or George or the people before us. Well, I understand that, but they're different different person and I'm going to have to deal with it the best way I can and she probably got some some people would have said that's not the way Phil did it and then some people may have told her that's not the way Phil did it and I'm glad <laughs> you know because yeah. each of us have areas of that that we're better at mine mine was not record keeping <laughs> and I'm sure Danielle is much better at that than I am than I was do you think you're one of the longer serving one in the county? I, I think I was. I was there, let's see, 91 through 2008, what, what is it, 1927 years? No, it wouldn't have been. Is that right? Yeah, 27. Nine, no. I guess so, goodness gracious. Yeah. Seven and one, one and seven, it's eight and nine and two. Yeah, twenty seven. Well, but let's see. I retired in eight. That would have been oh, seven. Oh, I was oh, seventeen years. Seventeen. Yes. I was seventeen years as the DC. I've been here nearly twenty seven. No, I think this is eighteen. Seventeen. Yeah, seventeen. Seventeen years as the district conservationist. I think so. <clears throat> Pete Otinger was the had been the district conservationist here a long time, but I don't think he was here quite that long. And then George Moreland, Gary Van Deventer, and then me. But I don't, I don't really rem remember how many years those people, it, looking back it seems so short, mm -hmm. you know. At the time it seems long, but well, and once you got here, you liked it so well you didn't look yes, to go get I, even I, closer I not, to home. No, it was. It had all the things that that I wanted. You know, responsibilities, the schools for my kids. Uh, the 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 thing that interested me was the, the livestock opportunities, mm -hmm. and and so I hit on to it. And I'm not sure that that what Danielle feels the same way. You'd have to ask her, but I think she's here to stay. You know, she was upwardly mobile at the time she moved here, and I figured that she could have gone to the state office if she would have wanted. Mm -hmm. But there's something about Caddo County that's just addicting, if you will. Do you have any idea what that might be? No, no. <laughs> I guess probably the people always have something to do with it. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it didn't have anything to do with the, the current trend of, uh, of cannabis growing or anything like that about being addicting. How many cotton gins are still in the county? Do you have any idea? Oh, Carnegie I'm, has one and they're building a new one. Minko. Does Minko? But see, they're not in Caddo County. They're Grady, but, aren't they? They're Grady County. And there's, a, there's, a, there's one down around Chattanooga. There are still some gins around. A few of them had gone out and they're building some new innovative things in cotton. You know, the way they harvest cotton now is so much different than it was from my childhood to now. Mm. I remember pulling bowls with a sack on my back 
and I was so relieved when the strippers came in and now they've got machines that cost upward of half a million dollars a piece mm. that roll it into round bales. It's much cleaner now when they get harvested so the processing is reduced. It's just so much different than you know the cotton industry. It took me a while to figure out the yellow and the pink bales are not hay bales. The, so they, they're cotton. That's right. And that's the wrapping, see. So I don't know if there's a difference for the color. Does the color mean something different? You know, that's a good question. I don't uh, know. They may be, <clears throat> it may be that they're different weights. Those bales are different sizes. So it could be that there's something to do with the, the size of the bale. I don't know. I I swore off of cotton when I after I had to pull that sack down that <laughs> that row <laughs> back in about oh my goodness I just think what year that was I was probably ten or twelve years old but I thought if I never see another cotton patch it uh, it'll be too quick. Well, did your mother pull pull it as well? Yes, she did. As a family ordeal. That's the reason we were out there is because she was pulling bowls and and. In order, we didn't know babysitters, and so the three kids of us at the time, we all had a sack. She took one long one and cut it into pieces and sewed the bottom shut so it'd keep us busy. And after a couple of hours, well, we'd take a nap on our sack instead <laughs> of pulling bowls. So we, we probably weren't very much help. We probably hindered her. So that was her way of getting us involved. And tiring you out. Yes, and tiring us out. We didn't have any trouble sleeping at night. <laughs> Did you get a little bit of money for to spend how you wanted? Y yes, let's see. I remember one time pulling 300 pounds, and as I recall, you got two cents a pound, so I got six dollars. And that was a that was a lot. I thought that was a lot of money. And was that a was one tenured. day one day to work? Or yes, one day, one day, one day. I guess there's always somebody else that can tell the story but my granddad told me that during the depression and times like that that he would build fence for people for a little supplemental income and and uh, for a dollar a day and he he said I would run between posts just to show him that I was a good hand mm -hmm. so we've not always been as affluent a society as we are today. Right. You know, we, when we go looking back at, at the difficulties that our parents and grandparents had, you know, I've got it, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but I've got it pretty easy. Well, sure. te the technology's helped and hurt, I guess, sure. in, in some sure. ways They're for always, that. There's always good with the bad, and, and for example, now my grandson will probably not make his living pulling cotton, and his, his future lies in what he can do on a computer, probably. We could still stay in ag sure some, he somehow, he can stay, or other. He can still stay in agriculture. <laughs> I may make that a requirement. <laughs> Well, in your time span, too, you went from the square bells to the round bells, yes. I guess. Yes, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Sure did. I, I tried a little bit of that. I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> Do you remember the first time you drove a tractor? Or did you did you drive yes. one? Yes. Yes, I did. Dad, Dad taught me probably before I was a teenager. Goodness, had an old M Farmall tricycle front end. It was... It was terrible to drive. They didn't have power steering in tractors back then. No cab. We were lucky that we had an umbrella on it. It's going to say sun's So sunscreen. hot. <laughs> Sweat bees stinging at you all the time and the dirt and the dust and the... There, I better... Yeah, it was dirt in my ear. It wasn't on the <laughs> The dirt would get in your eyes and in your ears and your nose. It was pretty miserable, but... I can remember Dad would try to do the farming in the day when it was hot and I would help him and I'd drive at night. <clears throat> Occasionally 
the lights were so poor on that old B, that old farm all that I drove, that you could barely see the ground, and it would uh, get so dim at night that I'd lose where my track was. If there wasn't a certain amount of moisture that you were pulling up, you couldn't tell where you had farmed and where you hadn't. And I was getting sleepy anyway, probably. But one night I woke up, started like that, and I was out in the middle of the field just meandering around. I didn't know it, but so I killed the tractor and walked back to the road, found the vehicle and, and drove on in and called it a night. And the next day, and Dad, Dad got a chuckle out of it because it looked like I had, if you'll pardon the expression, I'd been inebriated. <laughs> I was out just making figure eights out in the middle of that, that field where I'd been going. So it was a challenging time. A lot of, a lot of differences now in the way we, way we farm now versus back then. Well, there's, there are there certain smells that trigger, trigger memories. Mm -hmm. There probably are, uh, you know, you know, psychological things. Probably the smell of clean tilled soil. You know, you go in there and break it up, and you can smell the not only the soil smell, but sometimes the decaying vegetation and things like that have aromas that probably trigger things. Right now I couldn't tell you what that might be, but you know, it, it just hits you. When it's there, it's there, and when it's not, it's hard to think about it. Well, what's your favorite time on the farm? Oh, probably calving time. Hmm. I enjoy the, seeing the new calves hit the ground and and remembering that you know we made some progress here. We we're doing better. We're we're even doing some embryo transfer and we're doing some artificial insemination and and we made some good choices here. We've got some good bull calves on the ground and things like that. So it's it's kind of the the time that that's rewarding. It's kind of like harvest time when you're you're on the combine. You get to harvest what you've sown. Mm -hmm. That's that's probably my favorite time is the calving calving time. You're doing some genetic improvement type yes, things. Yes, yes. Try to. Mm -hmm. I guess we've always lived by the philosophy that if you're not moving forward, you know you're, you're either sitting still or you're moving backwards. Mm -hmm. Was there a certain time of year that usually is? Are they born ever? I mean, I don't know much about. We we calve twice a year. Twice, okay. And believe it or not, there's a practical reason for that is that I try to spend more money on a bull and I get to use him in the spring and then in the fall also. So we, we have a spring herd and we have a fall herd. We turn, just like t today, we've, we had cows standing and they're going to be AI'd tonight. When about 3.30 or 4 o'clock this afternoon, mm. we'll do our artificial insemination. So by, by breeding now, those, those calves will be born in September, next fall. Then in, then in May, we'll do this again and, and we'll breed and those calves will be born in February. During an ice storm is what I'm thinking. <laughs> you don't want that to happen. No, we never like an ice storm. When it's time to have... But we get to use one. then. Then after we AI, well, we'll we'll turn the cleanup bull, as we call him, and he he gets bred what we missed, and we get to use him twice a year instead of just once. Hmm. So that was the reason now, and it and it spreads our marketing out too. We market twice a year with the with the calves. And do you do that via the computer these days? We probably could, and and we do because we t sell some heifers and, and bulls private treaty. Mm -hmm. We'll put ads on on the computer. My daughter does that. And she'll put out ads that we've got bulls for sale or heifers for sale or something like that. And and then there are some that, that are lesser quality that we'll just take to the sale barn. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
I would imagine that's a whole different smell, sights, and sounds experience at, yes, the, sales, it is. at the sales farm. Yes, it is. We had a feedlot at Buffalo when I was on the farm with my father-in-law that the neighbors did, didn't appreciate. <laughs> Both those aromas that you were talking about and the flies. Oh, flies. <laughs> What's your father-in-law's name? Ed Rohr. Was he? My wife's, my wife's dad. Was he a conservation? Ed was a uh, conservation district employee, uh, not an employee, a director for either 50 or 55 years. I don't recall, but he got some state awards for for his longevity, and he was chairman of the Harper County Conservation District for quite a few years. Helped uh, helped in the watershed program up there, and and he was on the Rural Water Board. He was very active in his days. He's 90. He'll turn 94 years old this month. Wow. So he's had, he's had a good life. They gave you all something to talk about too. Some yes, com that's commonality right. that's there. Right. He, he and I got to uh, reminisce together. Well, he's seen a lot of changes. So yes, he's he been has. around that, that one, in that part of the world too. Fires, I'm sure, in Harper. Yes, they've had they had some bad ones up there. A uh, time oh. or two, they sure did. Well, there were a couple last couple of years. Yes, it wasn't was long ago. Yeah. And that's I guess gets into prescribed burns and that sort of that, that is conservation correct. issues. That's part of the management that we like. You know, if you just let it, native grasses especially can accumulate a lot of forage and then when we have dry years and a lot of winds, that's what California is getting into now, is questioning their management about whether or not, you know, if you go in on it with a prescribed burn and, and do it in a timely fashion, you can you can manage that a lot better than waiting on a wildfire to take it out. Do you do some of that in this county? Yes, we have. It's gotten very difficult. People have become afraid of fire. But quite a few years ago, we went through a time when NRCS employees could go out and do prescribed burns with, with a producer. And they had one in Texas, and as as the smoke plumes go in the air, it carries embers occasionally, and it will jump the fire guard. And one got away from them, and and burned a couple of employees to death. So at that point, NRCS issued a, a statement that said, no longer will NRCS employees set the fire. The producer has to do that. Mm. We could help with the prescription. We could tell them how wide the fire lane needed to be and what the wind speeds needed to be and the humidity and all of those things play a, a factor. We could help with that prescribed part of the burn, but we could not start the fire. So they had to tighten it up a little bit because of the loss of life. Mm. And it is it is difficult. It still is is very important in controlling excess forage, eastern red cedar or juniper. Oh, those uh, lovely things. Can can get overwhelming in an area. Up around Tologa has had quite a bit of experience with that. Their their cedar population just got out of hand. And they almost explode. Like a like a bomb when they get too hot, and when they do, then that shoots the embers into the air, and and they go down downwind a long ways. Mm. So they are a problem. But by helping control them when they're small, then a prescribed burn certainly has a place in good grassland management. You have to deal with that, but you, this county has some of those issues. Yes, Red sure cedar does. as well. Yes. What about? Anything on the endangered species that this county has to worry about? Oh, you know, I haven't seen that list of what what we had on the endangered species. Okay. There might be some, like there's a a blue darter. I don't know whether we ever had had that in this county or not. Probably the thing that we dealt with more uh, than than endangered species was digging up 
areas where we did excavation and di finding dinosaur bones and mm -hmm. things like that. Occasionally we would, a uh, contractor would get into some bones, then they call us immediately and we have to stop the contractor. We get the people from Norman to come out and they have to identify it. And then that depends on whether or not we can resume construction or not. Or not. And sometimes, you know, that puts a stop to work right quick. Mm -hmm. it's, it's in through archaeology department. That's happened some in this county? That, that has happened, yes, it has. Well, and then Native Americans would be the similar feed yes, into their. Yes, that's, that's right. If, if, we, if we find uh, old Native American and campgrounds and things like that, any kind of artifacts, then we had numbers to call and it shut down whatever we were doing at the time until it could be cleared. Yeah. A lot of, because in Caddo County, I haven't counted it up lately, but we had more tribal activity than about any other county. Now, Cherokee County in the Northeast, the Cherokee tribe and some of the other tribes were more active and more affluent over there, but I think if I'm not mistaken, we had maybe seven tribes in, in Caddo County. Did you do anything in particular with them through your through your office? Yes, we did. We we worked with them frequently on their lands. Hmm. There's a lot of Indian land in in Caddo County, and we they have uh, conservationists that work for them. But because of NRCS's experience in some areas and then we would consult with them and work with them on their tribal lands and we had conservation plans that we would help them with and things like that. It was, uh, we tried to work with the tribes as much as as they were willing. Now sometimes there was some friction. Mm. Sometimes there were friction between tribes, you know, just like there is with a brother and a sister. Mm. But sometimes uh, one tribe would want to go one direction and another tribe would want to go in another direction, so they had to compromise. How did you learn those skills, negotiation well, skills, <coughs> on the job? Sometimes <laughs> on the job training and, and, and just, uh, just listening and, oh, I don't know, you always wonder whether or not you learned or whether you uh, made as much progress as you should have, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, it's the same with the more employees you have. Yeah. You know, if you have a big office like we did, and you have five or six employees, you have five or six personalities. And with a with a DC that just had one employee, it was just him and them. So the more you have, the more possibility you have of of some type of friction. And. Working with people is is a part of that job. Did you ever have to fire anyone? No, I didn't. That's thank goodness. No, that's... I, I would not have been good at that. <laughs> I had, uh, as as chairman of this uh, church board, I had to fire a minister one time, mm -hmm. and it was not pleasant. Mm -hmm. I would have not been been good at that. <laughs> In, in human resources or whatever, whoever is responsible for that. Yeah. The thing about the federal government is there are appeal rights and it, it could go on for a long time. Mm. You've got a certain amount of stability. You really have to mess up bad to get terminated. Mm. But usually if if you're giving some warnings and some things like that. If if I if I were to say now, and I've had to I've had to do this in, to a few people and say, this can't happen again. If it does, you know, it's going in your report. Mm -hmm. And I have some things on my in my file that probably I wish were not there. <laughs> we had someone steal a, a camera back when digital cameras first came out. We lost it. We never did know where it went. We don't know if it was somebody inadvertently left it on the hood of the car as they drove off, 
or whether someone took it. <clears throat> but I got a letter of reprimand from the state office because that was my responsibility. Mm. And even though that didn't sit well with me at the time, it was shown in my file that I was negligent because of that camera being dis disappeared. I tried to plead my case, but and I think I, I made the point that it, I was trying to do my job and then, and then it was gone. So I think they eventually saw it, but nevertheless it's probably in that file somewhere. Where would the file be? In D.C.? I, you know, I don't or know. State it office may be, state now, office. I, I may be so old now that they, they, it started to disintegrate. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it may have been on uh, big chief tablet paper with number two pencil and it got yellowed and yellow. I don't know. Well, what other tools of the trade would you have out in the field besides the camera? What else would you carry or have oh, with you to we do carried, your work? Uh, laser instruments. When I first started, they were on a little tripod like you've got right there. And you had to level them by hand and, <clears throat> you know, you were limited on visibility and you had a person on the rod and you had a person running that, that instrument. Nowadays, they can take, uh, they, they take the instrument and they set it up and it's, you know, it's on a laser beam. Mm -hmm. And then a person can run a camera and he gets a beep and he knows that it's recorded in there. So lots of improvement in the surveying end of it. That's what my technicians took over and thank goodness they understood it a lot better than I did. I think and drones might come in handy these, yes, day, these days. Th they probably they probably will. They'll eventually be doing a lot of that. You know in livestock management now a rancher can get a drone and and he can sit out on the road and he can fly over the herd and he can check for cows that are calving or even check check his cattle and count them. So a lot of things that that will become opportunities that will pass me by. I just marvel at them. <laughs> well in the state of conservation, what is Oklahoma how is has Oklahoma made a name for itself and and and, and in what? Probably Oklahoma's one of the big feathers in Oklahoma's cap has been the watershed program. Mm -hmm. Because we were pioneers and we we jumped out and, and did so much of that early on, probably because of the reputation on the oh, the Dust Bowl days mm -hmm. too, the old Great Plains program and our revegetation, you know, we got a name for ourselves uh, in Oklahoma because of that. Conservation districts and NRC and, and soil conservation at the time worked together, you know, to get those things done. But I believe that probably watersheds would be probably top. Top. I think so. Well, what about in the next 10 years? What do you see on the horizon? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We're facing some uh, some issues, and it, I don't know when it'll happen or if it ever will, because of budget constraints and the number of people that live in rural communities now. They're just simply the, the voters are not here mm -hmm. as compared to uh, the big cities. So we won't have the the push. The, the people that are funding, we're, we're probably maybe faced with the requirement of being consolidated with Farm Service Agency at some point. I don't know that. They've been talking it for 10 years, hmm. but it has, hasn't happened yet. But, you know, eventually it could. With that, you know, NRCS has always had a career employee that might be promoted up the ladder to our state conservationist and so the person in the, the head of Oklahoma had the experience to because they came up through the ranks they started just like I did as a as a student trainee 
and then went to a soil conservationist and, and then to a district conservationist and an area conservationist. But if they go to political appointees, mm -hmm. then they might take somebody that was influential with the President of the United States and got him some votes and so they may put them into that political pointy and they know nothing about history of NRCS. So as you probably can tell, I'm not a fan of political appointees. It may happen. At the state or at the chief chief level. No, I'm, talk I'm talking about the chief. <laughs> uh, now if it works down to the state, Uh, you know, that that's the way Farm Service Agency works, mm -hmm. is is their head of their, in Oklahoma, theirs is a political appointee. Now the, now the, the chief nearly has to be, I suppose, I don't know, I, do, I don't work the Washington DC, you know, they, that's a different continent for me, but in, in our state of Oklahoma, I believe that they need to be uh, career employees. I think people agree with you that. Do you have an opinion on the name change from soil conservation to NRCS? Oh, I've gotten with it long enough that, you know, <laughs> it was a little difficult early on probably, but we do work with more than just the soil. And that was the, the push behind it. Mm -hmm. Soil and forage and, you know, and and we worked with uh, timber management some with with the forestry department and so we worked with more than one natural resource and more than just the soil too. yes yeah. that's right yeah. and so we I, I think that was appropriate I really do I didn't have a, I didn't have a, a real issue with that did, did the monarch initiative come through this county any have anything to do with it the, the butterflies yeah mm -hmm. Maybe I remember <clears throat> that along about the tail end of my career when the conservation stewardship program came out, there were some incentives that paid on the planting of, of certain plant materials that were conducive to drawing the monarch butterfly in. That's about all I'm familiar with. Milk it, was, milkweed. <laughs> it was toward the tail end of my career, it's okay. just about that last year, as far as I remember. In the last couple of years, it seems to have picked up speed. Has it? From I, can I know there are a lot of things that that they are offering opportunities on. One of them being the conservation of wildlife. For example, if we have a, a tank, a watering facility, for livestock, then things like raccoons and, and birds and so forth need to have a way to get out of that water. And so we, we pay on providing that ramp that goes down into the water so that they can get out mm -hmm. of the water should they fall in. So those are things that, that working in conjunction with the wildlife people shows that we can work together on things to for for everybody everybody likes to has a different viewpoint of what's the most important you know but the ecosystem nonetheless isn't that, it that, each yes. depends on the it's other. just like hearing now about global warming you know you some some people think uh, think one way and some another and, and there's probably good points on both sides but to be real vocal about it, you better be careful because you'll get on your news on CNN. You get your <laughs> picture on CNN. Well, we've covered a lot. Is there anything that I haven't asked that you want to make sure we get in there? Oh, goodness, Tanya, I don't, I, I can't think. Seems like I've just yacked on and on. No, you've done well. I've. Was there any uh, dangerous or frightening experience during your career? Did anything come to mind? Well, now that they can't go back and fire me over it, probably one. When they first started, uh, Donna was on one of my conservationists 
was on the four-wheeler with me. And you're not supposed to have but one of you on. But she was running the GPS, and I was driving. And we were on the South Canadian River up north of Hinton in really rough territory. And a person, we were doing an equip application, and you have to have an accurate measurement of how many acres of cedar trees on there if you're going to get an incentive for controlling eastern red cedar then we had to put an acreage figure on there and Donna was on the back on the, the luggage rack running the GPS and I was driving and trying to maneuver and we got into some steep country and and as I tried to make a turn that four-wheeler starts to roll and I yell at her jump off and she did she bailed and I couldn't get loose and the four-wheeler rolled over me two or three times rolling down the hill and the handlebars punched me right in the kidney I, she was worried about me ran to see if I was hurt and I was sore for a few days but that was a dangerous situation. It could have turned out much worse. Uh, naturally, my supervisor doesn't didn't know about this and still probably doesn't. I said, Did so you tell we may have anyone? to edit. We may have to edit this. <laughs> but the only people that uh, knew about that was the office people, and they they teased me about it a little bit. But just be more careful next time. That's right. Learn from my experiences. You had your seat belt on, or I guess, did they have seat? No. no. I what? did have, when I was supervisor here, one of my employees called in one day and said, Phil, I, I wrecked pickup today. I said, oh, no. He said, yeah, Bobby and I ran together. And, I, and they were my two technicians. And they were out on country road and they were probably both of them coming back for lunch. And they they ran into each other and told both pickups. So that was a difficult trying experience. I had I had a few like that, but it could have gotten them both hurt, both of them killed. Yeah, they T boned. They what they got mm -hmm. T boned. Mm. So I got teased about that at district conservationist meetings a few times. <laughs> From what I understand, those meetings were fun, though. Well, they, when when they laugh about it, you know that they like you anyway when they tease you. <laughs> <laughs> good camaraderie. I never, I never did have to sit in the corner. <laughs> it seems like it was a good community. Uh, it, working it, community. it was. It, like a family it was, almost. It was a challenge, but uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Well, then my last question is, how do you want history to remember you? Oh, I don't know that I want, you know, I want my family to remember me, but I don't know that I want to. That's the same thing. Historical, uh, I don't want to take uh, undue credit. Uh, I don't mind taking the responsibility, but I don't want well, to be. Just in general, how do you want, how oh, do you want to be remembered? Uh, diligent. I guess just just like I told you earlier, as I I worked, I wanted to be known as a guy that put in a full day's work for a full day's pay. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not the smartest, and I'm certainly not the best looking, and and so I just had to be diligent about what I did and and deliberate and try to be there for the people that I was intended to serve. Well, I'd say they were glad and happy to have you and missed you when you were not in the office anymore. Well, I don't know about missing me, but <laughs> <laughs> there were a few that might have missed me. There were a few that were glad to see Daniel come in. <laughs> oh. That's the way that is anywhere. Well, the state's better off with having you served as long as you did. Well, thank you. And your father, so the family in general. And my uncles. And your uncles. Yes, that's right. And your father-in-law. Yeah. And it's a, been a family 
Uh, act of love, they say. Family tradition. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing it with me today. It's been well, great. Thank you. I enjoyed it.